Hi and welcome to this video for the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. And my name is Bob Greenier and I'm going to take you through uh, the initial findings uh, over the past week. I want to caution you that this is very raw right now and we wanted to share it earlier but we wanted to verify as much as possible. It has all been public and all of the discussions or the principal discussions have been public but people have otherwise been distracted. So what I want to draw your attention to is part of the Project Dogbone series of experiments, in specific the glow stick type uh, that Alan uh, um, invented and uh, has been running over the last month and a half uh, in Santa Cruz in California. Uh, with this particular experiment we tried to take all of the learning from the people that we had spoken to over the years and the experiments that we had conducted. Uh, key to that was the information we received as a result of donations that enabled us to go and see Francesco Piantelli. So thank you very much for those people uh, that helped us uh, see that incredible scientist. Uh, also to the uh, New Energy Foundation that helped us do the Degano thermal measurement test that gave us the Bang experiment, which was key to some of the understanding that we're going to discuss today. And uh, they also, uh, some funding that was available from that also enabled me to go and meet in uh, Parkamov, uh, which was also very useful, building that relationship. So thank you to all of our donors uh, that have made this possible. So specifically I want to talk about the Glowstick 5.2 uh, experiments. You can see information about that on our main site. And there's a live document with the specifics for the equipment used and the fuel load. Uh, principally in this we were trying to treat the nickel in the best way that uh, various other re replicators, but principally Parkamov, had guided us to do so. So the actual reactor was Mullite, the same sort of uh, reactor that Parkamov used. It had a steel fuel cell uh, on the uh, so-called active side. And that contained uh, about uh, 0.9 of a gram, 900 milligrams of uh, AH50 Hunter Nickel, and about 150 milligrams of lithium aluminium hydride, and 50 milligrams of uh, nanoshell passivated lithium. So we have free lithium in there, we have lithium aluminium hydride, and we have uh, nickel. The ratio, as you'll notice, is 50 to 150, so it's a, a 25 to 75 ratio of free lithium to lithium aluminium hydride, which is a small departure uh, from the, uh, that given in Rossi's awarded patent, which is uh, 40 to 60. So the experiment I want to talk about is the one that we've been conducting over the last month and a half, or thereabouts, uh, and it's the Glowstick 5.2. And the key part of this experiment was to take on board the best of the learning from the people that we collaborated with over uh, the last year or so uh, with respect to the Project Dogbone experiment series. Uh, it's in a Glowstick type experiment as uh, first conceived by Alan Goldwater, and it is uh, a reactor that contains uh, AH50, a uh, hunter nickel, uh, about 900 milligrams, 150 milligrams of lithium aluminium hydride, and 50 milligrams of lithium. So the ratio is uh, 75 lithium aluminium hydride to 25% uh, 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 free lithium. Uh, the free lithium is uh, in the form of nanoshell uh, passivated. Uh, lithium uh, and the ratio is slightly divergent from the Rossi patent which is uh, essentially 50, uh, 30, 20 i.e. 60% 60% of the lithium aluminium hydride to 40% of, of free lithium uh, in the ratio between those two elements in the fuel. In this experiment uh, we wanted to keep the pressure below 0.5 of a bar as uh, advised to us by uh, Alexander Pokhamov uh, when, when we had concluded the experiment in Padua in Italy uh, after ICS, ICCF-19. A number of experiments we 
conducted never really did it as a natural cause. Um, so this experiment was uh, created, conceived with a bleed valve into uh, a vacuum chamber so that we could manage the pressure inside the cell. Secondly, we wanted to take on board the nickel processing uh, information from both Parkamov, uh, some things that Rossi had said, and also uh, our experience with uh, Francesco Piantelli. And that comprised of taking the uh, nickel and baking it in a vacuum um, and uh, increasing the temperature very quickly to drive off any water uh, and then processing it in hydrogen uh, to remove any oxides from the surface and then to try and pre-load it with hydrogen by um, sitting it in a reactor at a temperature and uh, seeing if it would absorb a certain amount of hydrogen. So after the nickel's initial processing, baking and uh, hydrogen exposure, it was taken out and mixed with the lithium aluminium hydride and the lithium, passivated lithium, in uh, an argon-filled disposable glove bag. This was then placed into the steel capsule, which was then placed into the reactor. And essentially what you're seeing on this graph is the start of the, the main part of the run. And uh, th this is all available and will be available if it isn't, you can't find it, it will be available, clearly. The uh, temperature data and everything you can get off Hugnet just by looking at these dates. So we're talking about the 30th of January here. So the fuel were, mix was loaded uh, into the uh, glow stick 5.2 and uh, we vacuumed it out and we let it sit for a long time and then we backed it out. And then we put some hydrogen in and then a little bit of heat and then backed it out. And then what we did was we took it up to the lower bound of what we could determine was the uh, lowest D by temperature for nickel, which was determined by Mossbauer analysis. So it's around about 133 degrees. Uh, so what we're sitting at here is uh, around about 135 plus in the cell. And we sat that from the uh, 2000 uh, on uh, UTC on the 1st to uh, some, approaching 4 o'clock on, on the 31st. So, sorry, on the 30th, the 1st to the 31st. So we sat there letting it sit in um, uh, uh, the hydrogen that's being evolved. And what we did was we managed the bleed valve into the uh, vacuum uh, vessel uh, such that we tried to keep the pressure uh, at or under one bar. And then we raised the temperature up in a, a, a number of steps uh, and continually uh, keeping the, regulating the pressure to keep it uh, around about one bar uh, until we took it up to the, the highest we could take it reasonably uh, and still be confident that we were under the Curie temperature of the nickel. And we let it sit there for a bit of time. And then what we did was we very very slowly pulled off the power and we took it down to the higher bound which I think is about 204 point something the highest bound of the the, the known sort of claims of what the D by temperature of nickel is uh, and uh, set it comfortably above that and then what we did was we took it as fast as possible of uh, kicking the power on full blast uh, through the, the Curie temperature and this is what you see this huge pulse of pressure here, which we then regulate down into the vacuum chamber. Uh, and we take it down a little bit and up a little bit and down a little bit and up a little bit. Uh, and then uh, we regulate the pressure down to about half a bar. So we're, we're forcing the kind of situation that Parkamov uh, said was desirable for the effect. And then what we're doing here is we're straddling the 500 degrees temperature zone um, on the outside, uh, even below that. Uh, so that we are uh, testing uh, this theory in the, in, in the or, or the claim in the Rossi patent that the lithium aluminium lithium hydride reversible reaction. Uh, so we've got half a bar, we're uh, going above and below sort of 500 degrees in the cell and that's what we're attempting to do there to see if it does anything uh, and then I'll take you a little bit forward So we let, let it sat at about 400 degrees on the outside. Uh, and what you're seeing here actually 
is, if I zoom in even more, uh, in calibrations, the uh, so-called active side was always sort of 10, 15 degrees below, and you're seeing it below here. This is the passive side, the red line. Yeah, so I'm going I'm to zoom back out on that. Uh, so then the next real major phase of the experiment was to take it up through the uh, melting point of lithium aluminium. Uh, and that's what we're doing here. And seeing if anything changes, and doesn't really change from uh, calibration. Uh, and then we take it through the temperature at which uh, lithium hydride breaks down. So um, we are, if I come over here, a little bit. So I think we look here. Uh, on the outside is, well, when, you, when we go through 800, I think it's about 1,050 in the cell. So we're going through the, the temperature at which uh, lithium hydride breaks down. And we wanted to see if anything interesting happened there. We didn't really see anything interesting happening there. Uh, and then during the course of uh, the end of last year and early part of this year, uh, we were looking back at the, the concept of what happened in Bang when we did the analysis of the, the um, solid uh, wetted uh, metal complex on the sintered nickel. Uh, we found it comprised of lithium aluminium, presumably hydrogen, but uh, what we found was there was a small percentage, sort of 4 6%, something like that, of dissolved nickel. And, uh, I was ruminating on that a, quite a bit and I was thinking, well, you know, that's probably it's dissolving some of the nickel from the, the, the powdered nickel. Uh, and, you know, if you have any kind of solution, uh, it has a level of saturation. It can be super saturated and that's the, the point at which it can't take any more of whatever it's dissolving into it. Um, uh, and it just gets to a point where it won't dissolve anymore. And my theory was kind of like, if you got it really super saturated and then you lowered the, the temperature, you know, would the nickel uh, precipitate out and create some nanoparticles? And I put that out and Echo, our fantastic uh, crowd researcher, who's a great asset to the project, he uh, found some papers that said basically lithium increasingly uh, dissolves nickel, uh, I think it was nickel, and then uh, if you lower the temperature then it has to precipitate out. So this is a concept of trying to uh, create uh, nanoparticles in, in the situ, in situ in the re reaction. So uh, <clears throat> we also wanted to do here the uh, the kind of uh, creating some nanoparticles and then like bang, banging the heat on. And that's what this kind of cycles was going on here. And it was quite, quite interesting. So Mark Yurjic uh, fantastically helped out with a number of uh, Alan's experiments and also with other technical aspects of uh, the glow sticks in Santa Cruz. And uh, he ran this part of the experiment uh, overnight on the uh, 2nd of February. Uh, going, yeah, on mostly the 2nd February. And basically we're cycling there with a period. Uh, this whole period of between 6 and 7, I think, is about 3.9 hours. So you can imagine this is quite a lot more. I don't know. Whatever that is. Uh, you can see on the live, the, the Hugnet recorded live data. But what was interesting is that during this period of cycling where we're trying to basically create nanoparticles and then destroy them, create nanoparticles, we're effectively going up as close to the boiling point of lithium as we think we dare. Maybe it's even boiling at this point, but, uh, and then we're going back down uh, until it, it's well solid, uh, not solid, uh, liquid rather. Uh, so this 800 degrees here, 
is about 1,000 or so, 1,035, 1,040 from calibration. And it's, it, unfortunately, it's not exact because the calibration was based on Glow Stick 5 um, uh, in terms of the internal temperature calibration. Anyway, so we're cycling up, cycling up and down. And what we're noticing, if I really zoom into this, is that as we uh, move through this period, the low end of the and the upper end uh, of the active side is kind of like pushing up, pushing up, pushing up, and it's kind of like crossing over. And then here it's kind of like on the same line. And then as we're into 10, it's kind of like it's above, and it's moved from a position of sort of 10 to 15 degrees below to 10 to 15 degrees above. Uh, and you know, this is quite interesting to us. Is this excess heat? I don't know. A lot of people have claimed excess heat, so we couldn't say anything really at this time. And uh, Alan came back in somewhere around here, and uh, I think just before these very high peaks here. And the decision was that we didn't really want to damage the reactor because we wanted to do a post calibration to see, it, a back booking calibration to see if this was actually really uh, excess heat. So what happened was the cell was cooled down, it was allowed to sit for a couple of days, there was a little heat up there. Uh, down here we didn't really see the crossover. Uh, it was allowed to sit for another day. Then we did like sort of this one here where there was a bit of crossover at the very top there for a short period of time when we were really trying to push it. But essentially what we tried to do is to take out the fuels uh, cartridge. Uh, but it, it, it turned out it was stuck in the cell and we were trying to get it out by heating it and uh, and in the end we kind of basically had to do the post calibration in the cell um, with uh, air and argon and uh, whatever else but uh, this will all be in the detail from the experiment but essentially we didn't really see these kind of signature uh, so-called excess heat periods and uh, I, I may be wrong in saying this, and, and, and the detail will be uh, out later, but uh, um, I think Alan said it's something around about 20%, so if you've got 1,150 watts in there and you're getting 20% excess heat, you can do the math on that. But uh, is it excess heat? I don't know. Uh, anyway, so because we were worried about destroying the reactor here, and we have been in the past, we would like to be able to run this kind of process after the very complex run-in for days and days and days. So uh, it was decided to try and attempt to, after these kind of various cycles here, to destroy the reactor. So we were going from high to low temperatures with a periodicity of like uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes. Uh, and we really, really, really tried hard. Now, there was a couple of things that could have meant that the excess heat wasn't real, maybe. Like, one of the, one of the sides, uh, had their res the resistance had changed and so it was dissipating more heat, or, uh, and, and that was discounted. Uh, or there'd been some sort of permanent shift that meant that we would see it anyway when there wasn't hydrogen in there or fuel, and, and that was discounted. Uh, we're in the process of uh, analyzing the thermocouples uh, to see that uh, they are still uh, working in the same temperature range by putting those into a, a furnace. Uh, but essentially, it doesn't look like they, they failed uh, and we didn't run them outside of their, their operating bounds. So uh, that, that's the main experiment. And so what happened on the 16th is uh, Alan started really making public all of the uh, spectrometer files from uh, a spectrometer that was offered for purchase to us by an English chap called Stephen. And uh, thank you very, very much, Stephen, for that donation. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, I'm gonna take you to an, another chart here now. Um, so Echo was very uh, perplexed. He says, I, I really don't know what's going on, uh, but Basically, all of the charts look pretty much the same from the spectrometer when they're normalized and they're adjusted for thermal drift. Uh, but what on earth is going on with trace seven? Trace seven. I mean, it's like uh, two orders of magnitude or one and a half orders of magnitude. It's, it's just huge. What's going on with that? Um, 
I mean, that's my eye just looking at it. And then Trace 8 looked a little bit odd as well. I mean, this, this kind of like not doing the, whatever everything else is doing. It's kind of like coming up here in the, in the low uh, x-rays. And so uh, this obviously looked really weird to, to me. And uh, I, I said to Echo, look, you know, can you give me just a, a rough graph taking, taking out this, uh, taking out the average of all the others except eight from uh, trace seven. And uh, so he did that. Uh, and it came up with this. I asked him to do it linear because, uh, I don't know why I just asked him to do it linear, so a lot of you people will probably laugh at that, uh, not being very scientific uh, to do that. But anyway, uh, I just looked at this graph and what struck me uh, immediately uh, was that pretty much all of this energy seemed to be below, as it looked then on this graph, below 300 kilo electron volts. And I thought, what I'm seeing in this image is that something I swear I've read somewhere else. Uh, and within about five minutes, I found a number of references uh, to this. Uh, and one of them was from from NASA's visit to Dithalion in Greece. Now, people have got various opinions about uh, what happened there, but what I can say uh, when I'm looking at this, uh, if I take this up to full screen, is uh, point two here, gamma radiation below 300 kV is generated from the reaction. I knew I'd seen it somewhere, and, and this is meant to be a extremely confidential report, <laughs> as it's saying here at the bottom. bottom. Uh, but it was, it was leaked, and it's been on the web for a very long time. And so I'm thinking this was said in private. This is what was seen. How do these two things square up? <laughs> uh, and so essentially what I, what I did was I, I, I asked I asked uh, Bob Higgins and uh, Echo if they could go away and, you know, tell me, um, you know, what it would take in terms of like lead or some other material to uh, attenuate or basically stop uh, 300 kV. And uh, so whilst that was going on, I, I also discovered that uh, there have been a number of instances where Rossi uh, had been quoted um, as saying uh, that the output spectra from the reactor is somewhere between uh, uh, 50 and 100 or below 100. And uh, the recent Cook paper uh, said exactly that. Okay, so it wasn't just Def Kali and Green Technologies, it was also uh, claims that Rossi here, this is from the presentation that uh, Norman Cook gave in Japan uh, about his theory about what might be going on uh, generating the heat in the Rossi reactor. And uh, he's saying, for several years, Rossi has said that the ECAP produces low-level gamma radiation, mostly 50 to 100 kV, but no outstanding peaks. And again, here at the ending, individually, most of the de-excitation de gammas are low energy, less than 100 kEV. So I'm then thinking, you know, what are we looking at when we are um, looking, sorry, not that one. <laughs> mm. When we are looking here on trace eight, which is subsequent to this ridiculously large burst, it would seem, uh, there are below 100 kV, there is what looks like a, um, you know, a signal coming up here. So if I, if I zoom into that, if I can zoom into that, is it going to zoom in here? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So what's happening here is this is cut off because the scintillator was not going to see anything below 30. Apparently, there's an attenuation between 30 and 50, and uh, you can see that rather than coming down here like the average of all the other traces, 
you're seeing it's coming back up. So after this big pulse, we've got this coming back up here. Uh, it's obviously not such a massive effect here, but it, there is definitely something going on there. So uh, the, 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 the things are kind of aligning here. Now, I want to draw your attention to, to a number of other things that kind of sit with this. Um, one is, but actually before we get onto that, uh, I would like to draw your attention to whereabouts this was occurring. So trace 7 and 8, at the time we didn't know where trace 7 or 8 were coming from. We needed to wait for Alan to get up. Uh, we didn't know where in the experimental run <laughs> it had happened. Uh, so we were sitting there a bit blind going, what's going on here? <laughs> Did something break? And uh, it turns out that the trace 7 and 8, the end time for those uh, was, uh, go back to the experiment run, I can do that again. Okay, so we wanted to know where this was and uh, we eventually tracked it down when Alan gave us uh, the kind of timestamps and stuff that the, the end of the trace was here at seven where we did this, the first really high temperature pulse and then we came down and then we came straight back up again. And then eight was this very long pulse. So actually this wasn't a very long pulse compared to some of the uh, uh, sample rather than some of the others. Um, but the, the very interesting thing to us, and it's where, when I started to get, say, okay, we think we might have seen excess heat, but there's this really ridiculous like pulse, what's that about? It happens here, and then after here, you get this transition where we think we're creating some excess heat. And uh, so, actually, when we look a little bit more at the data, uh, I'm gonna switch to, back to here, um, we thought what else, what else can we find out about what's going on here and uh, there's a part of the uh, system, the spec spectrometer system is it, if it kind of like gets saturated it kind of skips a sample and in uh, spectrum 7, well you can see all the spectrums along the bottom here um, and what's happening is uh, these are the sample times. So you've got the relative sample times, and you can see the even though there was a very very large time for this uh, spectrum 20, there was only a very few uh, samples missed. Uh, again, large sample time, only a few samples missed. Uh, but what's going on here? We've got quite a short sample time, but a huge number of samples missed. What's going on here? Well, this is spectrum seven. So something came out of the reactor as just before we went into what appeared to be excess heat mode that saturated uh, on an, maybe this was a very small pulse of saturations uh, and we're still looking to try and analyze that. But we, we've got three data points here. Uh, and so this leads me down to the next part of like correlating the history of, of the Rossi uh, uh, public demonstrations and, and what we've just experienced. So Francesco Cellani, thank you Francesco for enabling our project and having the bravery to share your technology with us. He when, was invited to uh, Rossi's first uh, public demonstration. I think it was about 30 people. It's all on our site. There's a, there's a, a blog I wrote in 2013 called Gamma, and it's very detailed there. But essentially, he came with two, uh, a spectrometer, a guy counter, or two spectrometers, it, it says on the site. Uh, one's a cheap battery operated thing, and one's a super expensive two and a half inch sodium uh, iodide uh, thallium doped crystal based one. And he, was, he had set them into count mode. And he's sitting there about seven to eight meters from where the reactor was in another room behind a closed door. And all of a sudden, both of these battery powered detectors went full scale, like can't go any higher, and their alarms went off. Uh, this happened for about a second. 
and there was a bit of a panic in the room. They thought, oh, well, there's some nuclear thing going on in there, we need to leave. And over the next two minutes, it sort of petered down to background again. And shortly after that, apparently Rossi came out of the room where the reactor was and said, the reaction started. So we have these huge poles here. We have uh, something going on here just before we have this uh, uh, period which we seem to think is excess heat. Okay, so switch on was somewhere here, maybe the down, maybe the up. Um, uh, but something happened here uh, and we, we started to see a building of the excess heat, uh, if that's what we can confirm. Like I say, this is still very preliminary, but um, we, we're a bit shocked by the results and we just want everyone to look at the publicly available data for, th this is on Hugnet, as I said before, and uh, the spectrometer files will all, all be shared uh, and, and see where we may be going wrong. But uh, it's certainly got quite interesting. So um, we continued doing a bit of analysis. Uh, and this is uh, another plot by Echo. He wrote some programs uh, to help us analyze plots. Uh, and you can see this is seven. These squiggly bits here are some sort of traces that follow seven. Uh, and then the rest of it's kind of basically down here. Okay. Um, but seven is just like, it's almost like way up here. Um, what is going on with that trace? So just, I asked the Echo at the time, could he produce a, a trace of just seven and eight with the rest, all of the rest removed, even the ones that were still in the excess heat here. And still, it's a strong signal that you see here between 100 and zero. There's this, well, 100 and the cutoff at 30. Uh, and again, look, look, look at that signal, it's just huge. So, um, here's actually an animation. And uh, so it's, it's running through the entire experiment and it's removing the background, which is a fairly long trace at the beginning where um, there was basically no temperature and it was just sitting there. So 24, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eights up here, nines there, tens there, and then we're out of excess heat. So um, this has got us quite excited. Uh, here you can see the uh, average of all of the traces except 7 to 11, the period in which we think we might have seen some excess heat. And all of them resampled into this uh, detailed trace line. The spread is when you've got a, a shorter sample, sample period, uh, you get less convergence on, on the mean. Uh, but let, let's go again. So it's going 13, 14, well, it's going to cycle around in a second. <laughs> So uh, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So this is the region in question. Something happened here. Uh, and we've asked the French Nuclear Authority, we sent them the, the chart, uh, Matthew in France sent them the chart, and uh, they said, oh, we've seen this before. It's a huge beta minus release. Okay, well, we, we didn't know that at the time when I, I had asked Bob to say, like, how much would, would it take to, to try and shield this, the first graph with the, the, the 300 kV and below, what it looked like at that point. And so I, I started investigating that and we found, I know that uh, I had seen somewhere actually reasonably recently and perhaps I should have read Matt's book. Thank you, Matt, uh, for giving me a signed copy. Um, I unfortunately haven't read it yet, but thank you. Uh, uh, and I probably should, would have learned this, but I was trying to find a picture of Rossi's reactor to try and get an idea of the bulk of it and you know whether there could be any radiation shielding in there to deal with this sort of 300 kV pulse that I thought it was at that time. 
And then uh, I came across this picture in Night Technique. Uh, it's from uh, the, his report of the 2011 Bologna test. It says, as I noticed underneath, that it says, after the test, the ECAT casing was opened. Inside, you could see a heat exchanger hidden behind the flanges. There were supposedly five centimeters of lead shielding enclosing the flat reactor. Uh, a unit with three reactor chambers, out of which only one was activated for, uh, at the test. Photo credit, Matt Lewin. Okay, so I, I went back to Bob and I, and I said, look, uh, you know, would, would five centimeters, 50 millimeters kind of shield this? And he said, well, yeah, if it did, but it, it, the reactor would be ridiculously heavy. Uh, anyway, so in the meantime, Echo had found a, uh, a site where we could go and um, test how much uh, okay. So in the meantime, Echo had gone away and found this uh, X-ray attenuation and absorption calculator, and I just thought, you know, let's let's see what do the maths here. So I'm just going to zoom in, but it's going to reset when I come out. So my target material here is uh, lead. Uh, I'm going to say it's 300 kV. I'm going to try and stop or thermalize. And I'm going to say 50 millimeters uh, and pressure there. Okay, fine. So calculate. Okay. Uh, okay, that's interesting. So these are the figures I get. If you have 50 millimeters of uh, lead and 300 kV, which Defcalion claimed uh, was the most that they would see, you've got a hundred percent attenuation. Zero transmission, which is technically impossible, but uh, and 99.9999% energy absorption. Okay. So on the one hand, we've we've observed this phenomenon of, of sort of zero to 300 at, at what we thought at the time, but certainly zero to 100 once it's in excess heat mode, uh, and we see, which I didn't know, and we discovered. Uh, on the 17th last week, when everyone was talking about something else, um, that uh, 50 millimeters, which is in the Rossi reactor, would absorb the heat, uh, the, the energy from, from these emissions. Uh, well, actually, we think that that initial pulse is vastly more than that, but if we assume that after that, uh, it's only 100 kV and less, it would, would sort that out. Interestingly, if, if you are actually only doing 100 kV, uh, you can probably stop that with one millimeter of, uh, uh, well, nearly one millimeter of uh, tungsten. Okay, so that's giving you some ideas for uh, where you can go with this. Okay, so then, then uh, it's, it gave me a, a bit of a sleepless night because I had this conversation with Bob and he was saying, oh, well, this would be ridiculously heavy if it really was 50 millimeters. So I said, Bob, you know what, I'll phone, this was on the 17th and I thought I, 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 I owed a call to, to Matt to find out about, you know, the, the, the shutting down of the one megawatt reactor or the end of the test. And um, I phoned him and I, Bob was on one side on Google Hangout and um, Matt was on the other. They couldn't hear each other, but I, I could hear them. So it was kind of like a Chinese whispers, but Bob said, Look, you know, it would weigh so much, okay? So I said to, to Max, I said, you know, we, we've got this result. It's implying that you would need this much shielding. Uh, you say on your... Um, uh, article in Night Technique that it was Rossi said it was uh, 50 millimeters. Is that like a uh, do you think that's true? Said, well, that's what he said. Uh, okay, and uh, so I said, well, Yeah, okay, Bob, he confirms it was 50 millimeters. And so then Bob says, Well, that would just be ridiculously heavy. I said, Well, okay, I'll, I'll just ask Matt how heavy it was. And he said, We, we put it on some bathroom scales because there was nothing else that would do it and it weighed 98 kilograms. Okay, so I told Bob and he says, yeah, but that would take like three, four men to lift it. So I said, okay, Matt, how, how did you get it onto the scales? He says, well, three or four of us has kind of lifted it down onto the scales. I go, okay, 
all right, th these things are kind of meshing here. Got something that happened in 2011, something that happened last week, and everything kind of adds up. And then I had a conversation with um, uh, uh, Bob about um, the fact that, you know, if, if, if it was running at these high temperatures, he said, oh yeah, but you couldn't do that. The, 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 the originally cat was running uh, under a different basis. Uh, and I said, well, actually, I remember seeing a, an interview by Ruby Carrot of, 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 of Rossi where she said, well, you know, what, what, what's the temperature inside the reactor? And he goes, well, you, you know, uh, it depends. Uh, you know, it's like the water's 100 and something. And, but then inside the reactor, I could swear he said like something like 1400 degrees. And Bob says, I, you know, I just don't believe it. I said, well, respectfully, we'll have to disagree. And it, this really tormented me. <laughs> okay, so then I kind of came up with a, a kind of like a brainwave that, that what must be going on here. Okay, so uh, let me dig up this. So here you've got the, the reactor in question. Uh, and if I go down, you'll see you've got some heat exchanging fins on the top side. Uh, this is a look, and you see this is kind of like bolted in. Uh, and there's some kind of feed coming in here and other feeds coming in here. Uh, and it's kind of sitting in a slightly longer this way there and so on high. And actually Matt said, oh, you, you didn't read my report. I said, what report? Oh, my report of that test. I said, uh, no, okay. So let, let me pull up that report. Okay, so the test of the energy catalyzer on uh, October the 6th, 2011. So the catalyzer was 50 by 60 by 35 centimeters. So I've uh, drawn a diagram over here, I think. I'll get this right. <laughs> I'm sure you meant to flip the other way. So, what, what we saw in those images just now, over here, uh, okay, is something that's kind of like uh, 50 wide, 60 deep, and uh, 35 high. Okay. And Bob was going, yeah, you can't get that much lead in there. And I'm going, well, maybe you can. And uh, so then, I asked, you know, Max, how uh, big were the reactors, did he say? And he said, oh, that's in the report too, so let's go back to the report. He's saying, but basically in this uh, 50 by 60 by 35 box, there was something inside it that was uh, 30 by 30 by 30, and supposedly the, there were three reactors of 20 by 20 by one. Okay, so 20 by 20 by one. Well, immediately this makes me think of the patent, Rossi's patent, this layer cake structure, okay? Uh, where you've got a heater element, some mica, some metal, which is going to resist the, whatever the reaction's going in here, and another metal, and it, it's like welded around the edges. So basically this would be a 20 by 20 cent, uh, centimeter uh, sort of flat cake with uh, one centimetre high and there would be like three of them in the reactor and he said only one was in operation at the time. Okay, so I started uh, doing a little bit of maths and uh, uh, so I pulled that up. So I think in how, how much lead would you need uh, to weigh 98 kilos? So I put 98 kilograms into this web calculator and uh, it's lead and it comes up with basically 8.64 liters of lead. Okay, so uh, what's the cubic volume of that? Let's, let's work out what we would need. And here we have something that, if we had something that was 25 by 25 by 13, centimeters, that would be 8.12 uh, uh, liters. So we want 8.65 or something like that, and, and, and this is 8.1. So I was just kind of saying this because it's, it's a rough amount of lead that would weigh the amount of the reactor minus all the other bits and the bit on the outside. Okay, so very, very easy in the central bit uh, 
where uh, it's claimed in the report that was made um, that the, the central bit of the reactor uh, was uh, 30 by 30 by 30. So I'm saying 25 by 25 by 13 would equal most of the weight you needed and certainly just add another centimetre on the top and you would have it. So that would have the amount of lead in there. So everything's kind of adding up here. Uh, and also he said like something like at the end of the test he unplugged it uh, or during the test he unplugged it and it kept boiling for like four hours or, or something like that. You can check these, these facts. But I just want you to look now inside the, the reactor and, uh, and imagine the inside of the reactor. So you've got a situation where you've got something in there that's 30 by 30 by 30. We only need something that's 25 by 25 by 13 to weigh almost everything you need. Maybe 14 would weigh everything you need if it was all lead. And in there you've got these layer cakes which are 20 by 20 uh, by 1 and they would easily fit in the center. They would push the volume of lead out a bit. And I would suggest that they're stacked on top of each other. And you're having a 5, so this is 20 side wide. And you've got 5 here, you've got 5 here, you've got 5 here, you've got 5 here. And you can have a bit of separation between the reactors. Now here's where the really interesting thing comes. Based on our experiment, and the findings that we've had, this 0 to 100 kilo electron volts. Imagine you've got this lead around here, which for the minute I'm going to just colour in green. So we've got lead around here, all the way around here. Okay. Got lead. And then What's happening? Rossi's heating this up for an hour with kilowatt, two kilowatts, whatever it was. Uh, it's in the report. Okay, and it, it, we've got water around the outside here somewhere. We've got a blue pin. We've got water all the way around here on the outside of that inner chamber. Yeah, in, in these fins as well, all over there, it's all water. Let's go back to the, the image on there, is that the best one? Yeah? So you've got water all the way around here, into these fins, and down the sides, maybe underneath as well. Okay? And in this like iron or whatever it is casing, you have basically a lump of lead. Now if you're heating this, lead's like melting at 300 and something degrees, at 300, whatever it is, what's the boiling, melting point of lead? Anyway, it's not that high. And our reactors are running at very elevated temperatures as we saw, sort of over 1,000 degrees, 1,100 degrees. So actually what's happening is the lead is becoming molten and it's a coolant. Okay, so we've now got our lead is now molten, okay? It's still stopping our 0 to 100 kilo electron volts, you know, that are, that are coming out of our reactor. And you know, if I heat this reactor up, it's going to affect this one. And then what happens is, this is like a black body and it's in back reflecting or back emitting into the reactors terahertz uh, frequency sort of infrared radiation. So we've got all the cooling going on on the outside here. So the last place to be cooled is right next to the reactors that are generating the heat. Any uh, emissions that are coming out uh, are um, being absorbed by the, the lead, heating it up, and the lead is then getting hot and it's, it's sending uh, terahertz frequency back. Now, <laughs> this, is, this is quite a bit of genius here. So basically, NASA are, are trying to find a way to create a terahertz stimulator for uh, uh, Lena reactions. And if you look up terahertz, 
uh, stimulation, the use of, one of the uses of it in energy. I was surprised last night when I came across, I was thinking, this is back radiating ter terahertz. And, and, and then I went to check and, and, and in there it said, NASA are considering using terahertz to stimulate nickel loaded with hydrogen for low energy nuclear reactions. Okay. <laughs> So basically, he heats this up, this goes liquid, it absorbs the radiation after it's been kicked on. The radiation comes back as terahertz, uh, you know, so you, you've got x-rays or whatever it is may, coming out here, being absorbed in the lid, maybe keeping it molten, the, the terahertz infrared's coming back and keeping the reaction going until this cools it down sufficiently, you have to give it another burst. So this explains the cycle. And the beauty of it is, is because you know that the energy is only going to go that far, you don't need to make the reactor much bigger to increase its scale. What you need to do is to have five cent, like if you want to quadruple the size of this plate, we just make it over there and over there, and then we have five, five centimeters around the outside, and we just increase the flow rate of water. The question is, why do we have the fins on the top here? Okay, why do we have the fins on the top here? Well, if you imagine this lead is, is boiling around here, the hottest part of the molten lead is going to be at the top, so you're going to want most of the cooling at the top. And that's it. So, what happened last week, uh, within a short period after uh, Alan made available the, the spectrometer data, is we understood where the energy is coming from. So <laughs> it's not in the reactor. The reactor doesn't have to necessarily be so hot. It doesn't have to radiate all of it from its surface because it's coming out as energy that's, that's attenuated over a distance in an absorbing material. Okay, so that's really clever. So that, it's taught us that. And it also gives you design cues for how you would make a reactor. But also it tells us, uh, uh, it explains this huge burst that, that, that Chalani saw when he turned on his reactor. And, and coming back to that, I just want to uh, reiterate that the French nuclear authority that Ma Mathieu asked says, this is a, a signature of a huge beta burst. And so, um, when, how is the energy being generated? Uh, I want to give you one more cue point. So, Piantelli is telling us he's, he's getting one of his standard sort of uh, El Nuovo Cemento reactors uh, uh, up and running. And there's a little glass pass through on one end, and he's kind of leaning down and, and, and adjusting it. And he gets, uh, as it's turning on or whatever, he ends up with a burn on his arm, okay, which he has to have treated or removed or something like that. So we don't know really what, where the energy has come from. Perhaps it's, it's kind of a combination between Pientelli, Cook, uh, uh, the Hydrino theory, some, something in that area. You know, maybe some Vysotsky in there, the, the, the discrete breathers, or as Pientelli would call them, the, the um, uh, anharmonic oscillations. But essentially, uh, I think we cracked this nut. Uh, I think we've got a recipe book right here for uh, you to replicate. Uh, we need to obviously try and do it again. Um, but this is a, a re really good cue. So I, <laughs> I'm quite excited. Uh, uh, we're going to be sharing a lot more information. And, and we hope you would really take a serious look at it and analyze it. So, uh, on a personal note, um, the is it positive or negative for the one megawatt reactor? It comes down to whether there was any um, long-lived radioactive isotopes in, in the ash, as far as I'm concerned. And really, until they pulled that out and, and looked at that, they, they couldn't make a judgment. Uh, so, uh, I think really, most of the outstanding questions <clears throat> have been answered in the last uh, few days for us following this discovery. Uh, so I'd like to thank uh, uh, my partner, Kim, uh, for enabling me to first go to Korea and to meet up with uh, Matthew Vallat and Ryan Hunt and, and, and Nico and uh, uh, Tyler and to form the MFMP. 
I'd like to thank uh, our first donor, uh, uh, Jed Rothwell, for uh, uh, inspiring, our first $1,000 donor that is, for inspiring us. Uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, uh, all of the donors that have made this possible. Uh, if you uh, are able to help us uh, take this research forward, I'd encourage you to go to quantumheat.org and uh, make a donation. Uh, I personally uh, have a GoFundMe and I would really appreciate if you could help me because I love doing this and uh, uh, also uh, we need to help. Uh, Matthew unfortunately lost his job last week because of, uh, he worked in the oil industry uh, and uh, uh, we, we need to help him go full time uh, for the project. So I really appeal to you guys but thank you particularly to the staff of uh, Bobcat Sweden. Uh, they made so much possible in the last couple of years and uh, to the New Energy Foundation, uh, to the Meningeti uh, uh, Award and uh, to everyone that's contributed. Uh, I'd like to say a particular thank you to Echo for the incredible work he did uh, and uh, the unstinting support that he's had uh, for our uh, open source project. I would like to uh, encourage everyone to get involved with the live open science that we conduct uh, on quantumheat.org. Uh, and I'd like to thank the scientists that have helped us along the way, particularly Piantelli and the donors that enabled us to go and see Piantelli. I would like, uh, because that helped with so much understanding. I would like to thank uh, uh, Alexander Pachamov uh, for his uh, uh, support and ongoing uh, assistance. Uh, I would like to thank um, uh, Paul Hunt, uh, particularly for the extreme amount of effort he went to uh, uh, to really solidify the, the, the value of the, the, the project. And um, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to some sleep. <laughs> thank you.